Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Caroline Griffin. I am Riot's Director of Operations. Very thankful to have you with us today. Before we get started, just a couple of quick reminders. If you have any questions throughout the event, please place those in the chat box. Aparna with Aurora Group is going to help me monitor that chat box. Um, so we'll make sure all your questions are answered. Um, please make sure you have yourself on mute. Um, we will give some time at the end. If you have additional questions, you'll be able to unmute yourself. But for now, please do mute yourself. And then last reminder, this presentation will be recorded and posted to Riot's YouTube channel and the meetup page to where you registered for this event. So you'll be able to find it afterwards. But without further ado, I know you guys are here to see the virtual lunch and learn session with the Aurora Group and Titan. So I will hand it over to Aparna. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for that kind introduction, Caroline. As Caroline mentioned, I'm with the Aurora Group and I represent a variety of electromechanical component manufacturers. Today, we're bringing you this lunch and learn session together with Tai Chen Platronics. Just a few words about the Aurora Group. At Aurora Group is a firm that we've been representing and supporting manufacturers for over 30 years in the Southeast. Just a bit more about what we do. Uh, we offer uh, and we are committed to technical and uh, facilitating technical component solutions for OEMs, CMs, engineers, and manufacturers. We offer technical ad advisory advice on quality manufacturers. We guide through technical challenges with new and existing product solutions. And of course, we're the product liaison for quotes, ordering samples and expediting. We touch on pretty much the full range of electromechanical components from magnetics to capacitors, electronics, as well as heat sinks, motion products, and motors. So pretty much any application you may be thinking of uh, designing, we can support you with. Here's a quick view of our team. We have uh, Bob Kirkland, myself, Ken, and Bob Ball in the Carolinas. We have Bruce in covering Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, and Karen in Georgia. We also have pretty good coverage throughout the East Coast, and we are also uh, connected with many trade groups. Here's a quick look at all the manufacturers we support. Here's also a quick look, including Riot, of the trade group association that we're a member of and participate with. And we also work with all the distributors. The main distributors for Platronics, uh, Tai Chen, are also noted here as well. And now we are ready to introduce our speakers. So a couple in what really prompted us to have this lunch and learn was the recent uh, TCXO shortage uh, that's been going on in the industry. I think most people who are in the industry really uh, understand this and want to have some, perhaps some potential alternatives is what we thought we'd present. Uh, we'll have uh, Jordan Wall presenting. He's a director of sales. You say a few words. And then the main man will be Corey, really talking about the precision, high precision clocks for tight stability applications. And what I will be doing is monitoring the chat box. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to uh, pop, type them in there and I'll jump right in. Uh, right now, I'm going to stop sharing my computer screen and hand it over to Corey uh, and Jordan to continue. Hello, everybody. My name is Jordan Wool. I'm a director of sales for Titan USA and Platronics. Um, so servicing all of North America in terms of our customers, distributors, uh, representatives like Aurora Group. Um, been with the company for 10 years. And so uh, we've got a full line of frequency control products, everything from a basic crystal up to an oven oscillator. Um, the, like the partner mentioned, the purpose of the meeting today is to kind of go over a solution that we have that um, should be of interest to certain manufacturers that are having a difficult time due to the TCXO shortage um, that we're experiencing currently because of the AKM factory um, with the unfortunate fire that they had uh, in November in Japan. Um, so with that, I'm gonna um, pass over the mic to my um, colleague, Corey Stone, who is our senior technical director uh, of sales. Um, so Corey, uh, I'll give it to you. 
Great. And I appreciate that, Jordan, uh, very much. And I appreciate uh, uh, Riot giving us the opportunity to present this. And, and we appreciate the, the, the fact that we've got a great quality sales representative in the Aurora Group. And, and this will be a relatively short presentation. The idea, as Jordan said, is to kind of just bring you up to speed on a situation we've got going on in the industry and then uh, the solution that we've got maybe that can help you out. So just kind of, uh, you know, we'll, we'll skip through the introduction real quick. We'll jump right to the problem. We'll, we'll talk about the options. We'll talk about the differences in our solution versus a TCXO solution. And then we'll talk about implementing our, our high precision clock oscillator in your TCXO application. So, um, you know, I consider Tai Chian and Platronics the best kept secret in North America. You probably haven't necessarily heard of us. Tai Chian, of course, is a, uh, a, a, an Asian manufacturer headquartered in Taiwan with complete high volume manufacturing support. They purchased Tai um, uh, Platronics a couple of years ago to give them a presence in North America. Platronics has the North American location. We've got engineering support in Linwood, Washington. We specialize in fast delivery, small lot sizes, customer requirements. Requirements. So between the two, Tai Chan and Platronics were uh, probably number 10, maybe number nine in the world, depending on the day. Um, we have the complete production capability, as Jordan said, from quartz to, to OCXOs and complete in-house production capability. So that uh, manufacturer is a big differentiator. There's a lot of guys in the crystal industry, but not everybody manufactures. Um, and whenever you're talking about, you know, quartz crystals, that manufacturing capability is a, is a key issue. So, you know, the reason why we're here is because there's been a major disruption in the supply chain for TCXOs and TCXO stands for temperature compensated crystal oscillator, um, which is um, a, a, a unique type of oscillator. Um, and that means the ASIC device that they were using was relatively unique to TCXOs. Uh, Asahi Kasai micro devices, better known as AKM, you know, suffered a fire in November of 2020, as Jordan indicated. They had about, and this was not a normal fire, they had um, 40 firefighters and 15 fire trucks pouring water on this fire for three days. And so, you know, just an intense amount of heat pouring out of that. And the picture here is, is actually a picture of the, of the foundry um, uh, that, that burned up. You can kind of see the, the fire actually started on the upper two floors of the foundry and you can kind of see the smoke damage there. And, and of course that meant all the water and everything was pouring down onto the bottom two stories of the factory. And, and it's my understanding right now that uh, it's uh, that the building suffered uh, structural damage and that they're gonna need to level that building and actually rebuild the foundry from ground up. And so the recovery is gonna be, you know, nine months at best mostly probably going to be more like uh, 12 months to 14 months until they actually start producing product out of the new foundry. You know, and, and why this is critical is because TCXOs are used in most wireless devices. Um, um, every mobile phone you have probably has a couple of them. Your car um, probably has eight or nine of them. Um, your Bluetooth devices, your IoT devices, as you know, utilize TCXOs. And, and really it's because they were relatively low cost. They were very easy to get and they did offer us some design margins. So, you know, in that regard, it was a, you know, a good choice. But unfortunately now TCXO lead time is six to nine months. And so not necessarily a good choice. So what are our options? Um, you know, your, your first option would be to go without TCXOs for nine months. And, and I, I don't know anybody that really wants to, wants to do that. Um, you can't bring yourself down like that. And, you know, the next option might be to try and build your own. Um, you could go out and buy a crystal. You could go out and, and, you know, buy a transistor or another IC to, you know, form your oscillator circuit. But, you know, it's all ultimately going to be bigger in size. It's going to be more power. It's going to be higher cost and it's going to be lower reliability. So, so even building your own is not a good alternative. And so, so really the, the alternative we're really left with is to use a high precision clock oscillator where we're using TCXOs because not all applications where we're using TCXOs require a, a TCXO. A, uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, we've got customers like Garmin and, 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 and Amazon, and they've got Bluetooth applications, and Bluetooth is not, a, 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 you know, a, a, a two part per million standard. Bluetooth is really a 20 part per million standard, and they were really just using the TCXO simply because it was already in their supply chain. 
But now, um, you know, like I said, um, in their applications, they're finding that they're really looking at the high precision clock oscillator because they didn't need the accuracy of a TCXO and they're not able to get it now. And we'll see that they're relatively close in, in size and cost. And so from a solution standpoint, I think it is a, a, a viable choice. So here's our options. Um, the high precision clock oscillators, we call them the, the dash B types. For Tai Chi N, it's the OZ-B, OX-B, OY-B. For Platronics, it's the QT22B, the QT33B, and the QT44B. It's relative to the package size. You know, a lot of the TCXOs were common in the 2.0 by 1.6 package size, and we have that size available. Um, 2.5 by 2.0 was a common size. 3.2 by 2.5 was a common size for CMOS TCXOs. So we've really got the size choices covered. We've got a wide frequency range. We can cover one to 200 megahertz. So that means we can cover the common frequencies that we're seeing in a lot of these applications, 20, 24, 26, 32, 40, 48. So we've got those almost on the shelf. Um, and it does have a tight frequency stability. Uh, and this is really the, one of the big differentiators in the high precision clock oscillator is because it is a clock. It does have temperature stability, 5 ppm minus 20 to plus 70, 12 ppm minus 30 to plus 85. So it's got a relatively good range and can operate over a range of supply voltages. So in general, where you've been using a TCXO, we got an option from a high precision clock oscillator standpoint. And, and what I wanted to do was run through the differences of the high stability, high precision clock oscillator and the TCXO. So we would, you know, you'd have be a better understanding about where those differences were. And of course, the biggest difference is the stability. We just get that in the name. Temperature compensated crystal oscillator means that the TCXO was compensated for errors in frequency that we would see. And, and over the life of the TCXO, a TCXO over a minus 30 to plus 85 is, is probably about 10 parts per million. Well, you know, for our dash B type, we can get 10 part per million total, but maybe over a limited, a little bit more limited temperature range, 20 ppm over that same minus 30 to plus 85. But again, these are within the standards that we see for, for Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or LoRa or something like that. So, um, but I think it's also important for us to understand, you know, what this means, because then we can, you know, we're better able to use the part and, and the fact that stability is actually calibration or the tolerance at 25 degrees, the, the error, the temperature stability of the error with temperature and then the aging of the part, the frequency will change over time. And here we've got a little bit more detailed look at the stability or the performance differences between the TCXO and the high precision clock oscillator. All crystals have a temperature error and that's represented by the red line in this graph. And you know what we do in a temperature compensated crystal oscillator is we add a, a compensating voltage or reactor diode that adjusts the frequency of the crystal in an opposite direction that it wants to go for temperature. So the marry of the two is actually the green line that we see. So we take a crystal that might have plus and minus 20 parts per million worth of error and through a reactor compensation, we're able to compensate it to plus and minus two parts per million. But, and so that's the temperature stability that we see here, the plus and minus 12 ppm of the red line going to the plus and minus two ppm of the, of the temperature compensated oscillator. But you can see the calibration or the tolerance at 25 degrees C is the same between the TCXOs. The aging or the stability of the oscillator over the life of, the, of your application is the same, basically plus and minus five ppm. And so really we roll all these up to that total tolerance tolerance number where a TCXO is about eight to 10 part per million total over the life of operation and a high precision clock oscillator is about 18 to 20 part per million over the life of your, your application. And your protocol will determine whether or not this error is gonna be you know, acceptable to you. It, you know, so that's the biggest thing you've got to understand is that the high precision oscillator um, is, is, is going to have a slightly higher stability than what you see in your TCXO. But for the most part, I think you can, you, you might be able to deal with that. There are other differences and we'll look at those right now. And, you know, uh, another big difference might be in the output type. A lot of TCXOs, particularly in the 2.0 by 1.6 millimeter package or the 2.0 by uh, 2.5 millimeter package are clipped sine wave output. Um, and you know that's really done as much for 
power is anything. It, it allows us to get a, a low power oscillator circuit. The dash B type or our high precision type is an LVC MOS output. So it does have a little bit higher drive capability. And, and that shows up in the, in the input power down at the bottom here. The TCXO is typically a two milliamp input power and the dash B type is typically a 20 milliamp input power. And so, you know, maybe not suitable for battery applic applications, but, you know, certainly if you've got a, you know, a power source, you know, something that can work. And, and the output phase noise is relatively close. The TCXO from a from an RMS phase jitter standpoint is about a half a picosecond and the high precision clock oscillator dash B type is about a picosecond. So from a noise standpoint, you know, it, it, they are relatively comparable. The da high precision dash B type is a PLL output and that's the phase noise plot that we see here. And, and, and it's that PLL that gives us that little, little bump in our noise and, and, and gives us that little rise. Beyond that, you know, the next biggest issue to me is the pin connections, um, you know, where um, if you've got a CMOS TCXO, it's almost a drop in replacement. Pin one on the high precision clock is an output enable pin, um, whereas on a lot of TCXOs, the pin one function is either no connect or it's a ground function. And, and you know, so um, if it's no connect, it's really kind of a drop in replacement. If it's uh, ground, you'll see we've got to make an adjustment for that. And then if it's a clip sign TCXO, you'll see another difference would be the output type that we had talked about. The, the high precision clock is a CMOS and, and the clip sign, uh, the TCXO might be the eclipse sign and and so you know uh, we under if we understand these differences then it can help us in our implementation and that's what we're looking at here is how would we implement uh, a high precision dash b type to replace a cmos tcxo in this case and and here we see the only difference that we have is that pin one connection with the output enable versus the pin one ground and and we just want to make sure that if if we've grounded that pin one in our tcxo um, we disconnect that ground the output enable on the high precision clock oscillator is if the logic level on pin one is a high or floating, the oscillator is working. If the logic level on pin one is a ground or zero, then the oscillator is disabled. So if we have a ground on pin one, we need to remove that ground to, re to ensure that the oscillator is in the uh, enable condition and producing an output for us. The next one gets a little bit trickier, and that's using the high precision dash B type to replace a clip sign TCXO. And here, what we have to do is really convert the CMOS output to a, a level or an input level that's acceptable for our chipset, you know, in the clip sign input. And here, what we would do is we would simply add a, a conversion circuit. We would add a couple of diodes to to, to drop the voltage, we would add a, a series resistor to limit the drive capability. And we would do all this before our DC cut capacitor. So we do it on, in a sense, the oscillator side of the, of the cut capacitor versus the chipset side of the cut capacitor. Typically, the resistor that you're going to put in is about 100 ohms. Um, but if your chipset is sensitive to high drive, then you may need to raise that to a kilo ohm. And, and you know, the diodes are the diodes. They drive uh, 0.7 volts and so that means your clip sine wave output is going to be about 0.7 to 0.8 volts peak to peak typical of the clip sign tcxo um, so absolutely dropping this right in there and again you got to keep in mind that pin one thing if the pin one of the tcxo is ground you'll need to disconnect that ground to make sure that that it's connecting so you know, so um, I've kind of rolled through this relatively quickly, but, you know, hopefully you saw that, you know, there is a major disruption in the TCXO supply chain that you need to be aware of, um, that, you know, you may be using a TCXO in an application that may not require it, and an enhanced stability clock like the Dash B type could be a viable solution for you. So, you know, get in touch with uh, Parna and, and, you know, the folks at Aurora, get in touch with, with Jordan or myself, let's talk about your application. Let's talk about your implementation and, and, you know, come up with a solution for you because we know you can't wait nine months um, to start getting TCXOs back. And, and we did just get an update from AKM. And, and while they are, you know, looking at plan B and, and, and that sort of thing, it's, it really does look like it's going to be um, the fourth quarter until AKM starts shipping ICs to the industry again. There are other 
TCXO ICs out there, but AKM had 80 to 90% of the market for a good reason. And that was their performance. And so, um, you know, while these other chips are out there, they don't look like they're really viable solutions to replace the AKM IC. So again, the enhanced ability clock is a good short-term solution. And, and actually I almost look at it as a longer term solution because um, uh, whenever the TCXOs come back, we know that they're gonna be a higher price than what they left at. And we know that they're gonna be in short supply initially is you know, the big players, the 800 pound gorillas in the market, you know, consume all that near term demand. So I really think that you'll find that the enhanced stability um, a clock oscillator uh, is a great solution to move forward with even in production. So, so Corey, can you uh, uh, talk a little, go back a few slides and talk about uh, some of the lead time differences um, for the two options? Yeah. So, um, and I guess I'm not sure where you wanted me to go, but um, the, slide. pardon? The next slide. Uh, this one or this one? No, further down. That one. Yes. Okay. All the type yeah. and Plotronics um, part numbers, what does that lead time look like? Right now, you know, for samples, we're talking about, you know, four weeks, couple, couple, four weeks. Um, for production quantities, we're talking about six to eight weeks. So uh, these are available on, at distributors now. Uh, that's correct. The initial stocking orders are in process. So I guess I'm not sure that it's actually on the shelves now, but if not, they'll be there soon. Okay. Um, yeah. Does anybody from yeah, that the would be the the DigiKeys, the Mausers, the yeah. uh, you know those types of guys? So, does anybody in the audience have any design related questions? I haven't seen too many of those questions yet, but uh, any design related questions may is a great time to ask. Corey's very very good at ask answering those. Well, we do it with frequency, so uh, um, you know, feel free. Is there any other uh, things that you can think of that people need to be aware of? Well, I think the people, uh, you know, I, I think this is an important slide for people to understand because a lot of times whenever we talk about crystals and oscillators, we um, sometimes like whenever we talk about clock oscillators, we tend to use a total tolerance type of number because the, um, and so whenever we talk about high precision clock oscillators, we'll tend to talk about a, a one year total tolerance or a lifetime total tolerance of, of 20 part per million or 25 part per million, something like that. When we talk about TCXOs, we tend to cut because the numbers are cut smaller. Um, we tend to talk about them more individually. So whenever they talk about a two part per million TCXO, they're really only talking about the temperature stability. They're not talking about the calibration tolerance and they're not talking about the, um, about the aging rate. These would be things that generally are included in the clock number whenever we talk about them, but not in the TCXO number. So I think it's important that as you're looking at the products you're using and, and even talking about alternate products that you understand, um, you know, the accuracies and the tolerances that you are using and making a, a good comparison that way. Can you talk a little bit about the power difference between uh, the TCXO and the high precision dash Bs? Yeah. And, you know, this is, uh, um, you know, uh, the clip sign, of course, does give us a, a low power capability The the 20 milliamps max is really kind of the worst case number. Of course, if they have a low uh, capacitive load on their on the output of the device um, or their chipset has a low capacitive load, then the dash B type isn't necessarily going to draw the full 20 milliamps. But um, so this is uh, the input current of the dash B type is somewhat related to the amount of output drive we're expecting from it. Um, this is a worst case number. Um, and so we would really expect it to be more closer to, um, you know, 10 milliamps, which is, you know, maybe a 5x trade-off versus the 10x trade-off. So uh, what are some applications that absolutely you just have to stick with the TCXO? 
Um, so an application that uh, you'd have to, you know, stick with the TCXO might be a GPS type of application. You know, you, you need to have a high accuracy device there. Um, LAR is my understanding is, you know, is a 50 part per million type of tolerance. So LAR would be a place that if you're using a, a TCXO, you could easily switch to a, a high precision clock. Bluetooth is a, probably the biggest application that we've seen where people are using TCXOs and they do not need this to of the TCXO, um, and and uh, um, you know that would be 26 megahertz, and and uh, um, I think they're again just using the TCXO because of its uh, availability, but now because you and and because of the availability before this incident happened, tight stability clocks were available, but they were only um, priced the same as a TCXO. So if you could get a two part per million part at the same price as a 20 part per million part, you would buy the two part per million part. But now we know coming back, TCXOs are gonna be higher. We know right now you can't get uh, TCXOs. And so the high precision dash B type is a viable alternative to TCXOs where you might've used it for cost and availability reasons before. The high precision dash B type is the cost and availability solution right now. Got it. Um, not seeing a whole lot of questions yet. Well, that means the presentation was very good. Um, <laughs> yeah, answered cool. every pre answered all the questions through the presentation. So yep. I, I doubt it was that good, but um, you know, um, you know. Well, one of the gentlemen said that hadn't heard of the shortage yet, as they're using, uh, you know, prototypes uh, for MCUs with oscillators, um, not precision timing. So uh, they don't need that precision, uh, you know, in his application. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is, you know, this is, you know, uh, I'll, I'll just give you, a, I'll call you an industry update. And I think lead times, you know, 2020 was a difficult year for the frequency control industry. Um, you know, we have, uh, there's a shortage of 32.768 kilohertz watch crystals. So the 32 kilohertz watch crystals, the lead time is still extended in terms of, of uh, four to six months. Um, in terms of availability, um, we had the AKM fire, which interrupted, you know, TCXO supply. And, and then we had the, you know, the, of course, the pandemic situation, which affected our factories and our abilities to produce in the factory. So 2020 was a, was a very difficult year. Um, in response to that, though, I think, you know, what is a normal lead time is no longer a normal lead time. Um, so I would encourage all, everybody that's on the call, if you're a user of these types of products, just to go out and check your supply chain, check your lead times, because we know lead times are getting longer in the, in, in the market. Um, the people that weren't using the, you know, the other guy, there were other guys that made TCXO ICs, but as everybody else starts to buy those chips, then those lead times will go out. And we know the foundries are getting full you know, with other types of chips. And so we see IC lead time in general moving out. The automotive industry is driving huge volumes. And so we see shortages in terms of packages, um, you know, and so, you know, uh, we see our, our raw materials, ICs and packages moving out. The good news is we're a quartz manufacturer. We cut our own quartz, we dice our own quartz, we make our own crystals. And so we're in control of that particular portion of the, of, of, of the of the part and so you know no worries there but you know if you look at an oscillator it's three basic things it's a crystal it's a package and it's an ic the lead time and cost is moving up on two of those things the package and the ic um you know we're controlling the cost on the crystal but you know it, uh, it just kind of goes back to check your supply chain and make sure you understand what your lead times are um and you know uh work with your suppliers so that they're taking care of you so Corey, we had a tough question here. Uh, do other manufacturers offer equivalent to uh, the Dash B type that we talked about? So there are a few other manufacturers that offer an equivalent to the Dash B type. You know, the real secret behind the Dash B type is, is you know, we're taking quartz and, and actually one moment. We take a bar of quartz like this. Mm -hmm. Quartz is the second hardest material known to man, and and we slice it 
down to thicknesses that are thinner than a sheet of paper. We, we work in thicknesses that are in the thousandths of an inch. A 20 megahertz crystal uh, is, is about three thousandths of an inch thick. A sheet of paper is about four thousandths of an inch thick. So we're taking quartz, the second hardest material known to man. We're cutting it into wafers that are thinner than a sheet of paper. And the angle at which we cut it determines the temperature characteristic. So if I cut it at this angle, I get one temperature characteristic. If I cut it at this angle, I get a different temperature characteristic. And so the ability to make a dash B type is your ability to control that angle. If you can't control that angle, you can't control that temperature characteristic. And so you can't control the tolerance of the part. And whenever we talk about angle control, we talk about, you know, angles are divided up into degrees. Degrees are divided up into minutes and minutes are divided up into seconds. We talk about our angle control in terms of plus and minus 15 seconds worth of angle control in the way we cut that. Um, which results in about a couple of part per million variation in terms of the temperature curve, um, which is the reason why we can produce um, a dash B type. And so the reason why I went through that for you was A, so you'd understand quartz and how we cut it and how we get to some of the things that we do, but it really takes a manufacturer to make a dash B type because you have to have control over your processes. And if you don't have control, you know, you can't, in a sense, you can't buy it type of thing. You might be able to screen it, uh, you know, buy a, a part from somebody else and then screen it to a tighter level, but it takes a manufacturer to ensure the quality and ensure the, the tolerance. So yes, that there are a few other people that, that, uh, that do the, de de the dash B type. That was the, the short answer, Corey. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Take a very tough situation and break it down into um, you know, a good alternative solution that could work in a lot of applications except GPS related applications. Yeah, that's the big one. Uh, GPS and, and or, or RF might be another, another one that I would throw in there, you know. Okay. Well, we're a little bit light on the questions. Uh, Jordan, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, I think Corey covered it fairly well, but um, yeah, I would just encourage everybody to kind of do a little bit of homework on this AKM situation. I saw a couple uh, messages um, from folks who weren't aware of it. And I talked to actually a lot of our, you know, kind of tier two and tier three customers that really haven't, um, haven't uh, heard about it yet. Um, most of your large volume users know exactly what's going on. And they started back in like mid November trying to come up with uh, alternatives. So, um, but even if let's say you're using one to 5,000 pieces a year, um, you know, th there's gonna be issues um, in sourcing that product. A lot of the customers are looking to other equivalent part numbers or they're making concessions on the spec just to have something to use, maybe a, a, a narrower temp range or what have you. But um, yeah, it's one of those things that um, you want to get in front of the curve uh, to, you know, make sure that you have supply of some sort um, coming in to your manufacturing. Yeah. Um, you know, Jordan kind of reminded me of something as he was, he was talking about that. And that's the, you know, the temperature range and the temperature range has a lot to do with the ultimate stability that we can achieve with the, with the dash B type. And, and you saw that we were talking about, you know, plus and minus 10 PPM over minus 20 to plus 70, but it goes to plus and minus 20 PPM over minus 30 to plus 70 degrees. So if you're able to work over a narrower temperature range, zero to 60, zero to 50, something like that, then we can actually beat these numbers and almost hit TCXO types of stability. So, you know, if you're able to control your temperature range to a relatively narrow degree, then this becomes a phenomenal replacement for the TCXO in terms of stability. But, okay. mm -hmm. And okay. that's all comes down to, you know, if you, you the, the three big sources of error in crystals is, is time, temperature, and calibration. That's, you know, what we, what we have here. Um, you know, and, and uh, if you can control the temperature, then you've done one thing to really just improve the stability of your oscillator, so. Okay. Hey, Corey, this is Bob Ball. Okay. You mentioned to us, I think last week, that as, as AKM comes back online, the crystals that are gonna be put out, they're gonna have different circuits in it. So most all customers are gonna to have to reevaluate or re-engineer. Can you address that? 
Sure. So, um, you know, there's uh, three ways that, that, that we see AKM coming back. And, um, <clears throat> you know, the first way is uh, to take the existing ICs that they were building and, and have them fabbed outside. And so indeed they are doing that. They've taken their, their, their mass sets and they've provided them to an outside manufacturer and they've manufactured or in the process of manufacturing some samples. So, you know, there will be a fab change at a minimum you will be looking at a fab change. And whether that requires requalification in your activity or not, you know, for the major, uh, you know, for the tier one guys, you know, like the Cisco's and those types of people, they'll probably end up requalifying it because of that fab change. I'm not sure that that would be necessary. Um, there probably will also be an IC change. I think uh, um, we know that uh, AKM is not coming back with all the ICs that they left with. Um, they're going to be changing wafer size. They're going to be moving from a six inch wafer to an eight inch wafer. And, you know, that automatically means that some of their mass sets are no longer usable. And if you're familiar with ICs, you know that IC mass sets cost multiple millions of dollars. And so, um, you know, they aren't going to tool up uh, multiple, they aren't going to take the old ICs to the new dice, the new wafer size. So we know that some of the old ICs will be going back. And so most probably you'll be looking at some level of requalification. If the IC that you were using was not the IC that they're bringing back, then you're gonna be getting a different part and you're gonna to have to look at requalification. And then third way is other manufacturers. We know that some suppliers are using and, and us too are looking at other IC suppliers. Um, you know, that make TCXO ICs. They were, there was a reason why they were a small volume in the marketplace. Um, and it would be difficult for them to come back and replace, you know, any of the AKM stuff. And um, we are seeing performance differences between the other guys and, and AKM. And so, um, you know, a third choice would be to use a non AKM IC, but there again, you're going to have to look at the differences in terms of, of, uh, and noise and voltage stability, load stability, those types of things. Well, thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, so far, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Uh, again, uh, I think you can probably go to the last slide, put your um, name and phone number at the bottom. Um, this, will, this presentation will be sent out uh, a lot to all the registrants uh, by Riot. And if you have an urgent question regarding this, please feel free to reach out to us at the Aurora Group or Jordan or Corey directly. And really thank you for attending this meeting. And I will be turning it back over to Caroline if no one has any additional questions. I'd just like to jump in. Um, you know, the other thing that AKM made was D to A's and, and, and D to DAX for audio equipment. And so if you're looking at buying a TV soundbar for the Super Bowl or a TV for the Super Bowl, you might want to get your consumer audio equipment early. <laughs> it's a good, a good to know. I'm keeping mine. There you go. There you go. So back to you, Caroline. Sorry, Caroline. Thank you so much, Aparna. No, that's, that's a great advice, Corey, um, for sure. We do have a question that just came in, actually. Um, from Robert, when will AKM chips built by another fab be available for your TCXOs? We're talking about third quarter. So uh, we're anticipating receiving our first samples of the new fab ICs at the end of the second quarter. Um, if they're acceptable, it will take AKM another 16 weeks to start producing chips from there. So, you know, we're talking about uh, probably um, I say early October for um, the next AKM product. That's helpful. Thanks, Corey. Great question, Robert, as Perna said. Well, we'll leave it open for just another minute for questions, but um, I encourage you to reach out to Jordan, Corey, also Perna, the Aurora Group. Aurora Group has been a long time supporter of Riot. We're, we're thankful to have them in our sponsor ecosystem and really thankful to have the guys from Taichin here today. Um, if no other questions come in, I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks for joining us. And as Aparna mentioned, you'll be able to find this on the Meetup page and on Riot's YouTube channel. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.